this podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Patreon is a monthly subscription that you can cancel anytime. And PayPal is a one-time donation. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. And you can find us on our YouTube channel with the same name. And you can start watching the episodes as they're released. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. I'm Rani Shatah. And this is The Beirut Banyan. Is thank you for willing to join the podcast during a time of a lot of flux. Things are very shaky. Um, I think it's just minutes ago the prime minister stepped down, to offered his resignation. Uh, the government is officially no longer an official government, <laughs> caretaker capacity. That's nothing new for Lebanon. We've been down this road many times, many times. but it's fresh. And... Uh, the last few days, things have been very unstable, um, and this is all after the blasts happened. So you have protesters back on the street. At times, certain ministries are taken over. Um, there's a push for change, and it's a it's fresh. I think the momentum has sort of uh, has come back in many ways. And then, of course, it's just less than a week ago, the blasts that uh, changed everything. And uh, we agreed to talk before the blast yeah. happened. And I, the reason I reached out to you uh, is because you shared something online, uh, sort of uh, the need to force change. And our conversation was meant to reflect on that. Yeah. And I think it's more appropriate now than before. And I, I fully agree with that sentiment. We also agreed not to get too... Uh, detailed in terms of economics and finance, even though that is your area of specialty. But I think it's maybe this conversation is better to just sort of step back a bit and and also at the same time try to hone in, if possible, on what exactly does a forced change feel like in the Lebanese context and whether or not we're actually seeing it happen right now. Yeah. So that's just, that's a very yeah. sort of long that's introduction. To, yeah. but, but I think it sort of sets the stage for where we are. I mean, uh, less than a week after a, a hor horrible incident that shook Absolutely, Beirut. Absolutely, yeah. I and mean, it's very sad how in our history we always need a traumatic event to trigger something in us or to trigger a, an actual change or a wind of change, but yeah. that's the reality. And Nafiz, can I just before, I mean, we, we spoke just a bit before recording. Uh, your immediate family and friends, I'm guessing it's the same thing like me, where you just know too many people that sustained material damage or perhaps there's actual injury, but we're, we're both maybe lucky in that sense that we don't know anyone who died. It's that's insane. Exact, that's exactly it. I mean, I, I've been, it, what, what's crazy is the number of people that reach out to you when, when they know you're Lebanese, either from back home or abroad, and immediately they're like, oh, is everybody okay? And you start thinking, you know, who, who, who's everybody, you know, family, friends, everyone's there. So in my case, it's family's okay material damage to a lot of people I know, both family and friends, um, uh, injuries among some friends and homelessness or, you know, damage materially enough for, for friends not to be able to go back home. Yeah. But luckily, and I'm thankful, and I'm one of the lucky few, I guess, that I don't have, I don't know personally people who have died or who have lost their lives in this, uh, in this massive explosion. And so for that, I'm, you know, I, I'm thankful. But it's touched everyone that I know in Lebanon, either directly or indirectly, in Beirut, or even, you know, I know people living in the cities around, and they're telling me, oh, if we hadn't had the windows open, they would have blown through 10 yeah. kilometers away, 15 yeah. kilometers away. It's, so um, it is that scale. I mean, the material damage is, is, is constricted to half the city or a few blocks, let's say, but the, the actual damage is much further than that across the spectrum these are strange silver linings in the lebanese context today where it's you know the good news is that it's injury Not and died. yeah exactly what i mean that's wrong with us? <laughs> these are the it's it's horrible yeah. the whole the whole event is just uh i think it's shaken everyone who has some some even even curiosity for what's happening in lebanon i think it's shaken us to our core 
I, I have not slept well in, uh, in since Tuesday, and I hope it doesn't show too much on this episode. <laughs> I've sustained a slight injury from slipping in the shower, and I kind uh, of... I'm not commenting. <laughs> yeah, it shows, right? It shows a little too much. We're all the same, I think. I yeah, mean, I mean... I, I, even for all of us who don't live there, or even, I mean, it's just... You're just completely obsessed. You're 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 scared. You're yeah. you're anxious. Uh, a lot of us aren't sleeping either. I mean, uh, the, the other thing is, I mean, it's horrific. Like I kept, the first two nights, I could I just kept replaying those videos. I mean, the, imagine my first reaction when I first saw the first one was, "This is photoshopped. It's yeah, a, it's, yeah, it yeah, looks yeah, like an atomic bomb. Like it can't be. What is that?" And then. You see the videos, all the angles. You're like, "Wow, it's not photoshopped. This actually just happened." Yeah. it's horrific. It's just absolutely horrific. And it, it, even though it's not a, an atomic or nuclear blast, the fact that it looks like one, uh, yeah, I think know, the visual impact is very grave. Yeah, absolutely. I think symbolism is very important here, and that it's not the tip. This is the Lebanese sort of context. It's not the typical explosion that we're familiar with. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly, exactly. This is not this a sort of be one for the history books. For exactly, sure, yeah. it's not from the sky. This is not a missile. It's not. Uh, it's not a political assassination that no. we're familiar with. Which was the rumors at the fir- at when it first happened. Exactly, uh, you know, it was close to Gaza, okay. right? That was the first people's first impulse, first reaction. Yeah, minutes. Uh, well, sorry, not minutes. Days before the uh, the verdict was supposed to be issued, and we all went there in terms of the the usual exactly. sort of uh, the usual stuff that happens. But this is a Lebanese made disaster and uh, I think in my sense it's and I'm not trying to uh, sound prejudiced towards that word Lebanese I mean it only that it's all the problems that we've faced in modern history lining up to the worst incident we've experienced and you know and I, I should also maybe say that carefully we've gone through terrible events I mean the Civil War is not that long ago many people have been killed in in different ways in Lebanese history but this kind of explosion is new and I think the magnitude is new and also the fact that the whole world watched it together I think it speaks to the moment too yeah yeah Yeah. I think there's I think the way you put it as symbolism like if you think of it as a a homegrown Lebanese accumulation of, of, of events that led yeah. to this explosion, which is the neglect, the corruption, the incompetence, the politics, the, the cronyism, everything you want, just exploding into this thing. And and the symbolism of that, and on top of that, if you look if you look at it from, a, from an observer point of view, because it was such a big thing, people mm. now are asking questions, like, what happened in Lebanon? I've had to explain to so many people <laughs> who aren't Lebanese what happened in Lebanon. And they think, oh, it's like those explosions in China last year where right. the nitrite ammonium blew up and yeah. it was an industrial accident. I was like, guys, it's not an industrial accident. This is not a warehouse that blew up in a zone that's way out of town. This yeah. is Barfa Beirut in the middle of the capital city. That's that's an entirely preventable accident, and it was only caused because of this accumulation of events. Yeah. So, in the in the to the extent that this can sway minds and public opinion abroad, which we also know is important for the Lebanese internal context, that symbolism is also very important. And explaining how and why it happened is, is very key, I think, to to at least swaying minds abroad because people don't yeah. think, oh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Beirut, assassination, Gaza, and same thing. That's how they associate it. Right. Uh, you know, the French have the saying, whenever they want to refer to chaos, they say, oh, say, say come Beirut, you know, it's like Beirut, you know, like right. from the 80s because Beirut was that. Yes. Um, and I think it's very important that in a way, you you know you started this episode with are we or is there a wind of change is there is there a potential for change in this whole thing and and I think I think it's such a it's such an in your face moment if there's any silver lining from a big picture point of view it's probably this that you know this, this, this will Nafiz, you do my you do my work for for me because <laughs> I love segues and that's the segue and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that's a natural. <laughs> <laughs> You're I good at stop listening to the episode. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. Now I just have. It's like, oh, that, oh there we go. Here we Going are. Back at you. <laughs> yeah. Well done. So oh, let's yeah. let's go there. Let's go there. Let's let's do two things. Let's uh, maybe maybe limiting it to the Lebanese experience. What a an escalation or or force change would look like, and whether or not. The last 24 hours, maybe the last 48 hours, but over the weekend and, and what happened today, uh, if that is exactly what forced change looks like, 
or if it's the usual routine. Yeah. And I mean, I mean maybe yeah. we can sort of start off with when you shared that tweet, and it's less than two weeks ago, uh, of the need for forced change. And I know I'm, I'm putting a bit of a burden on you to go back in time and try to explain what you meant, but, but I'm curious about what that would look like to you as a Lebanese citizen wanting change and we're not able to get there easily what force change is and and what it and what it is for you in your most immediate uh, yeah. experience it's 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 hard i think um so if i just take a step back you know for me the big moment is is the 4th of august more than the last 24 hours and mm. I'll, I'll, mm. I'll explain that in, in a second but when we think about force change you know, you think sometimes you think revolution, coup d'etat, army, yeah. blood, you think force change, like you wake up overnight and something's changed in the governance system or or somebody's taken over or, you know, there's going to be a new set of rules. Yeah. In Lebanon's case, that's not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen that way. So when I think of change in, in this moment, I think this might this might be a trigger or a catalyst for a process that gets unleashed now and eventually culminates in a change. In the Lebanese context, we get too excited. We're always too excited. We're like, okay, Nukhalas, this is going to be the one that knocks them all down. No, it's not, right? We need we need to, 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 come to somehow see it in the context that it is, which is yeah. that a series of events have happened since, let's say, or five, or maybe before that, but a series of events have happened such that we take two steps forward, one step back, sometimes two steps back, then another step forward, then one step back, then three steps back, then one step forward, right? Yeah. Now, this will this moment lead to, on average, having more steps forward than steps back? This is what I'm. This is what I'm trying to understand as as change, because that's how it's going to happen. I think I think that's going. So we're going to lay the seeds for something that we can reap in the next, hopefully, not too many years. So the change is not necessarily in the positive sense. It, it's just well, change in, it's, in that it, it, it's, the, it's the usual back and forth. Well, but that's what I'm trying to say. Is this event going to, to catalyze a positive change? And by yeah. this, I mean three yeah. things. Look, let's, let's think. How, how do you frame how you... I frame my understanding of Lebanon, let's say, if simplistically, okay? Post-Civil War till now, yeah? Three ways that the system works, okay? One is that the post-war leadership, the post-war sectarian leadership, has control of the narrative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other main point is that they have they have control of the institutions of the state. And those two things are interlinked because you have control of the narrative by by going to your sectarian instincts and by making a group against group. So when you weaken the state, you need to then control the state's institutions so you can kind of ensure your group's protection survival. and survival, right? Yeah. So you, take, you say the state's weak, we need to control the state. Mm -hmm. But then to top it all off, you need some form of physical access to arms or violence or, or quelling or suppression or what, what have you. So we have, we've had all those three things since yeah. the end of the war, yeah? yeah. What, what's been happening over the last 10 years, let's say, I, I, I like to think of it as 05, just because 05 is in my mind when maybe there was this revival of hey maybe we want a different kind of Lebanon yeah you know in a, in a, in a, in a populistic sense mm -hmm. um, since then though we've been chipping away at a the narrative part so chipping away at the monopolistic control of the narrative of what is Lebanon right and two at the trying to chip away at the institution bit which is trying to regain control of institutions, establish accountability, you know, what's nice about these last few months is how much we've been talking about of forensic audits, 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 accountability, accountability, and yani we want functional institutions, okay? Yeah. So if you weaken those two things, the people who are in power, what do they have left? They have violence, right? So in my view, I think we can take two steps forward by chipping away at the narrative side of things and the t regaining control of the state. And the risk there is that they react through the violence bit. Okay. Which is so that's, that's what we're my seeing. That's step forward, one step back. Which is the beginnings of which is what we're seeing. I right. Think. We're seeing them lose control of the narrative. We're seeing the uh, popular demand for accountability and strengthening of state institutions. And then there's that void where the violence comes in and, uh, and then we might be back into a situation where they reinforce those two things by using violence as the mechanism to do that.
But let me, okay, let, and this I mean it in a, in a healthy exchange, it's not really to challenge anything you've said. I mean it in terms of uh, comparing dramatic change in other situations to, to Lebanon. I like that you went back to the end of the Civil War. And you've also sort of set the marker at 2005, meaning in many ways it's that first push, mm. which maybe did not get us where we wanted, mm. but it's still an escalation. But 30 years ago, and I've used this comparison recently with friends in private conversations, mm. 30 years ago you had an escalation throughout Eastern Europe that we don't even think of anymore. Ceausescu mm. uh, killed by his people. Uh, the Eastern European bloc countries' regimes falling, replaced with something else, revolutions that took hold, um, fundamental change to society, things that were very dramatic. I mean, it's not just symbolism in the sense that it's not just the Berlin Wall that was brought down. It's that these countries changed for good. And I, I sense that that may be that kind of revolution, which I think of as what a revolution should look like, meaning that you sort of close a chapter and open something new, has never happened in the Lebanese context. And I, I mean, I'm comparing 30 years ago only because they line up together. 1989, yeah, yeah. Uh, if assigned in 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. Yeah. But I mean, the system that we're, the system that is being sort of challenged over and over seems to be the one thing that has survived <laughs> all all attempted change and i say that knowing that there's a deep desire now for something new something different yet october 17 i mean that's you know, we're going to hit the one year marker comparing october 17 what a year. i mean yeah exactly what a year and i know that many things went wrong beyond beyond anyone's control and that includes COVID 19. it's mm. i mean this year has been extremely tough on on many countries lebanon in particular but that said i have not seen beyond small symbolic achievements which are important i have not seen big change happening and and sorry that that includes also six days after the blasts that there's no one who's in a position of power who's afraid i would include the <laughs> prime minister who stepped down That's today a, such a statement yeah no, and i would yeah, include the, yeah, the yeah. prime minister who, who offered his resignation i mean yes his speech was okay and that yes he's admitting that there are things that are structurally wrong but i mean this is not a situation where a prime minister should even show their face on tv no, the I president mean. is on tv uh the speaker of parliament seems at ease Th these are things that uh are alien i think to successful revolutions in, in recent history now that framework am i am i oversimplifying things in lebanon by looking at it that way i, I yes and no my my view is that it's very difficult to compare lebanon even though with eastern europe or or the fall of the soviet union um i guess for two reasons because the first one is that the aside from a few places like Yugoslavia, where there was really ethnic makeups and, and a lot yeah. of religious sectarianism that you could compare to Lebanon, in the in the rest of the countries, it was really this kind of there was a unity to what you were uh, uh, revolting against, and that unity was uh, based on a promise of something better, which was you know uh, free markets, you know democracy, liberal systems, individual rights, rather than the oppression of a Soviet system. So yeah. that, so it's kind of, it's easier to unite against that one thing and, and, uh, and pour all of your energy into it. Right. Yeah. We are not We're if you want, Lebanon is as if you're facing multiple dictatorships. It's like an oligarchy of dictators. Okay. So you can't channel your energy at one guy because there's like seven or eight other guys you have to go after. And that by definition means that you can't be unified against all of them. Mm hmm. OK, so my biggest kind of what I'm having trouble with, not trouble with, but what, what I find is a good testament to what I'm saying is how much you see people willing to, for example, killon yani killon. the tenacity to say killon yani killon and actually mean it is one thing. Yeah. And to say it as a slogan, but your guy is excluded from killon. And no, anta, your guy, he's good, but killon yani killon means everyone else. This is, this is a common, I think, uh, um, mentality in Lebanon. So if that's the case, you know, you'll have less 
it'll be harder to find common um, allies to fight off that one guy because your ally might be the guy trying to topple your guy and you won't have it. But in that in that setting, and I, I you said olig oligarchy of dictators. Yeah. I think uh, the, the more romantic version is Kamel Salibi's House of Many Mansions. House but, of Many Mansions. Yeah. I, but I'll, I'll, I'll go with yours. Let's, I think, get, let's get to that in a bit. Yeah. yeah. His is more, you know, end of World War I and the birth of modern Lebanon. Let's go with the end of, <laughs> of the 20th century yeah. and Lebanon sort of uh, stumbling and falling. Into Down, the to the Down to the dictators. Down to the dictators. <laughs> but in that sense, in that sense, and I, I agree with you. I mean, it's clear that Lebanese problems had had the population had an overarching idea of what change should look like, what it should feel like. We would have gotten there, I think, long ago. But I and I, you're absolutely right. I mean, the Lebanese context is different than than the Czech Republic or or than, uh, for that matter, most if not all countries, with the exception of former Yugoslavia. And then you have former Yugoslavia, which had so much external support and trying yeah. to patch things up together that may, maybe they would have looked more like Lebanon without that external support. And that's something I think Lebanon cannot achieve, sort of a, a lifeline that is determined to help improve the situation. Our lifelines are usually at the expense of yeah, Lebanon. There's always a cost, yeah. There's a cost, and, and it, they're usually, for the most part, they're negative. But, 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 uh, this phrase, oligarchy of dictators, when everyone is suffering together, and when the economy crashes, and when you have October 17 is not born out of joy, it's born out of severe pain. October 17 is the moment sort of things explode. I mean, on an emotional scale, all, almost everyone in Lebanon is suffering. The, and it's a cross-sectarian, cross-community feeling. Even then, why is it so difficult to see the leadership among communities being sort of pushed aside? And I, I ask this in, like, in a very simple way. Let's choose one person, the president. I mean, it's still surprising to me that he has not been forced to resign or he has not stepped down or that people around him have not pressured him to go or for that matter that if it's going to be in the Lebanese context, that his community maybe sees him as a, as a serious problem. I'm trying to make this as delicate as possible without sort of hurling any, uh, any slur. Uh, there's a lot of... Your questions are hard. I think the, <laughs> the, the, the problem the problem is it's you know the hard the harder question would the, the harder that, questions would be uh, Kifa Knaf is that, that that's <laughs> yeah. that's the question no one has an answer to. No, nobody can answer <laughs> nobody, that. Yeah, we're yeah. all numb. We're all yeah. numb. Um, but I think I think you know part of part of the way I understand Lebanon uh, and and going back to my three kind of let's say uh, foundations is you know we. Um, the, our, sect, our sectarian leaders are almost our mini presidents, right? They're, every sect has its guy, and yeah. that guy is revered. That guy can do no bad. That guy's faults are always somebody else's cause. Somebody else has caused them, right? So unless, for example, in, the, in your example, the president steps down, will only step down when there is an internal demand from his own party to do so. Okay, it, it, he will never step down because the other party wants him to because because it's my guy and your guy and as long as that's how we think about politics as long as that's how politics is determined in the country um, then it becomes very different it's very difficult for one group to force change on another group if that other group accounts their leader as one of their guys if you see what I mean right um, I think sometimes of, uh, of South Africa I don't know if you remember Zuma the South African president sure, accused yeah. of hundreds and hundreds yeah. of cases of bribery and corruption and, and the whole idea of state capture, right? That, that, that concept, which applies so very well to Lebanon, but in a slightly yeah. different way, is actually a South African concept in the sense that the state was captured by private interests. Here we're talking, you know, business corruption and contracting and bribes and stuff like that. They tried to get Zuma out of power for decades yeah. and for years. Let's for, say. Yeah, and, right. Yeah. And, and, and the difference with South Africa and us is that they have a very strong uh, culture of, of judiciary independence and the courts are well respected. At least the higher courts are, the lower courts, whatever. But once the once the appeals get to the higher court or the Supreme Court, it's a pretty, you know, solid There's some separation. Yeah. 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 You, you know, you so when Zuma left and resigned, it was only under the pressure of his party. 
It wasn't the 783 cases of corruption against him. It wasn't the protests on the streets. It wasn't. It was when his party said, you know what, look, the future of this party is in jeopardy. You need to step aside. You're one of us and, and we don't want you anymore. You're gone. We need to we need to reorient this party in a different way to react to people's discontent and so on and so forth. So they pushed him out. That's when he resigned. It wasn't the courts that were after him and it wasn't the state yeah. capture commission or whatever. Now, what will Im compel a Lebanese party, let's say the FPM, to tell its president, look, we need to respond to the streets because we're getting a lot of heat for this, for your conduct, so you need to step aside and we need to clean up our image. That's not how it works because right. your image is in opposition to somebody else. So if you're bowing down to their demands, it means you're weak. That's how we do politics. It means... Yeah, but in that sense, then, and I I'm, maybe I'm overstepping here, I, I wanted to sort of project from that, is uh, that there's no room for forced change in the Lebanese context that, that's healthy and nonviolent and that sort of transition that's the peaceful. Only, you know, and, you cannot, and when you're an economist, you like to say things like cautiously optimistic and things like that. So yeah. cautious optimism is like when you have a, a, a silver lining, but there's so many downside risks that it might just completely upset them. But my cautious optimism, if you want, comes from the idea that a a growing a growing uh, chunk of the population and i hope i'm right on this is challenging the narrative okay yeah uh, uh, if in if within every party a growing percentage of party adherents start thinking you know what man this isn't really working for me what about my individual rights what about my family what about you know what about you know, I'm, I'm sick of living in fear and all this. And they start to wake up to the fact that they're, the system they're in forces that on them. Mm. That's, that's an avenue for change because you're going to be less compelled to vote for them. The I other, the other yeah. tiny silver lining I have is that, you know, they always talk about Lebanese being resilient and Lebanese, uh, you, know, you know, they can take anything that's thrown at them. And in a sense... I agree in the sense that, you know, all this corruption and all this decades of waste, if you if you label them as economic co costs, so you have to pay a bribe, mm -hmm, you have to mm -hmm. have to wasta, you have to, you need to know someone, um, you get, you know, you have to pay the motor. And these are economic costs, okay? Yeah. So it makes it more expensive and more annoying to live in this country. Mm -hmm. But the moment that this corruption, neglect, and efficiency touches your actual life, the life of your kids, the life of your family, there was a guy on, on uh, it's a very sad story, but uh, one of the comments by one of the fathers who lost a yes, kid. Yes, his three-year-old three daughter. Um, yeah. You know her name he was Alexandra. Alexandra. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, you know what he said? He's like, I know what it means to live in Lebanon, and I knew what all the risks were, but never in my life did I imagine that I couldn't protect my own family in my own home. Yeah, yeah. I, okay? I, yeah. That's, that's, that's a level of, Yanni, when it touches you, and I think so far the corruption and the neglect and the, the cronyism in Lebanon has been of an economic nature, at, you know, aside from all those episodes where we had assassinations and killings and like that, but... On an individual basis, every person could still go about their life with that added cost of doing so. Whereas now, you actually feel targeted. You actually feel like, wow, I'm worth nothing here. I'm an, I'm an, I'm a, I can just, my daughter can just, you know. Die. That, yeah. that might, that might be the spark that really gets people to think, well, if this whole system was based on you protecting me as my sectarian leader, well, clearly you failed. If this system was, was based on you assuring my economic rights and my well-being and my safety, you've also failed. If, right. if it's about, you know, the bad guy, I'll be like, well, you know what, everybody who came down to, 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 to the Christian area of Beirut to help out came from Baalbek and from Akkar and from Jnub and from Shuf and from Matin and from Kisrwen. All of them came to help me. It wasn't just the guy that the party sent me that came to help. It's not just the, the food parcels coming from the party headquarters. No, they're going to come from all these NGOs who are distributing uh, to everybody. So that social connection that's born out of a catastrophe like this one might be one of the silver linings where people wake up and say, A, my individual rights matter, not my group rights or my group allegiance because I didn't get those secured even though you promised you would and two I'm actually getting support from across the spectrum from other sects from other regions my neighbors from other parts of the country
If that kind of feeling mm. starts to grow and cement itself, then I can see a situation where a different kind of politics might be born, and you might be able to talk to, to you might be able to reach these people with a different message than just this classic fear mongering, our rights, the uh, inception of Lebanon, Christians, Muslim, tak tak tak. That's that's why I have this cautious optimism. That's where it comes from. No, but I appreciate that sentiment because it transcends everything. I, um, you know, that, that it, what you just eloquently described, the day-to-day -day living that's already difficult, if not intolerable for mm -hmm. anyone, yet they, they have to go through the usual channels to just live a normal life. Yeah. And I like that you said that this is an incident that is, this is not, this does not fit the narrative. Yeah. The narrative yeah. that you that you sort of described, which is that you can still be protected by your by the usual suspects. And in this case They failed them. They failed them. And it's a G it's, it's 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 geographic, it's not communitarian. If you were living in Beirut during the explosion by default, you're at risk of dying. And the closer you are to the port, the more at risk you are. That's not that's that's so beyond the usual uh, narrative. Exactly, and no, who we want to want to ethnic? Yeah, either. and there's been attempts at kind of trying, and it, did, it didn't fly. It just didn't fly. That we all associate with Jamaiz and Madam Khayyib. We all drive next to the Everybody, port. Exactly. Downtown is downtown, and you know what? Ras Beirut was damaged too. And it's sheer luck. It's sheer luck that the uh, the, the silos were facing that way and not that way. Yeah. I mean, the silos maybe spared more damage to certain to the Corniche yeah. and, and Ras Absolutely. Beirut and the the Mediterranean saved us Swallow from the rest. Half of it, yeah. yeah, but I mean, the fact is, if you were close enough to the port, or even if you're in Beirut during that explosion, you were at risk of dying. And and that uh, that it's hard to swallow. Yeah, and maybe. Okay, so the silver lining is that the narrative which kept Lebanon from changing fundamentally, at least, let's use the marker of the end of the Civil War. We could go earlier, but let's just, for convenience, let's say since 1990, that an explosion like this could set the stage for a reinterpretation of what it means to be Lebanese. Because, and I want to, I'm going to try to frame this carefully. Um, do you think that weeks from now, months from now, maybe years from now, after a new election, after a lot of whatever, cleanup, after a lot of humanitarian aid, that uh, this would translate into what you're describing, which is, I'm no longer part of a community, I am a citizen? And the reason I'm asking it this way is because I still think, and I, I could be wrong here, I still think that the change that, that you're describing, which is the change I want to see as well, I think more seeds should have been planted already. And that those seeds include, include just pure fear. I don't think regimes, uh, I think the longer they have in terms of restructuring and absorbing, and the more, the more time they have, the, the, the more... Is yeah, the more likely they'll they'll stick they'll around. Stick, yeah. And to me, to me, six days is not that long, but it's yeah. long enough to have seen something happen, other than those symbolic moments, which were important. Citizens storming buildings, and certain ministries that had already been emptied, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Citizens went in, and they took it, and they said, this is ours. These are symbolic achievements, and they're very important. But beyond that, I don't think Hassan Diab's resignation is that kind of achievement. I no look. I mean, just two things. I mean, Hassan Diab's resignation. <laughs> he was a dead fish in the water anyway, yeah. and you know, with Lebanon, you know, you have to look at the big picture, the forces sure. behind it. So, in a way, it's it's bad because we're back to square zero. We're back to. I mean, not yeah. that this government was a response to the revolution. That's the biggest right. joke of of of, of all. Yeah. Uh, but th that you know that we're back into this political vacuum at this particular moment in our history is scary. Yeah. It's a scary, it's a scary thought. And it's, it is exactly your point, which it is a very high chance that we just go back to business as usual, that we bicker over the next government for three months, or that they give some caretaker government, some sort of transitional powers, which end up being usurped by the political forces that be. And at the end of it, my biggest fear is that we end up with some, variant of a grand bargain 
Papa F2.0, uh, uh, you know, that just kind of shuts everybody up. That's, nips what, a, the butt what an upgrade. Butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But what it would do, what it would do is it would, like what you said, those seeds should have been planted earlier, right? Yeah. So what I was going to answer to you was to say, my other big risk or my other fear is that everything you and I and a lot of us talk about and, 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 and you know, you know, lives in a maybe like a Twitter bubble or something where there are some of us who have these aspirations and these goals. And sometimes I wonder how, how much of this is shared more widely, 10% of the population 15% of the population, you know, how do I know that if I went down to a random village or city and I started talking to people, I would have warm reception to these kinds of ideas? I would probably bet that that number is on the low side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. then us, we talk to each other a lot. So we, we read each other's work and we know each other's thoughts. So it almost makes it feel like this is how Lebanon thinks, but it probably yeah. isn't. Yeah. Right. So the way out of this is how do I convince somebody like, let's say, our parents' generation, who, you know, they've got this one foot in, one foot out. They get what's happening. Uh, they're, they're happy. You know, you know, there's somebody going to revolt because they never did. And all the corruption they lived through, maybe. It, but at the same time, they're more fe fearful than we are. They're more like the ones who are going to protect what they're familiar with. Okay. Yeah. How do I convince this voter, this person, that, you know what? This change is actually for the better and that you gain from this new system or whatever it is. Because other than talking to each other and having like a literally a bottom up approach to alleviate the fears of all these communities, to alleviate, to, to, to kind of you know, to, you know, to, to convince people of this new narrative, which some of us believe in and adhere to, yeah. but we need to make it a wider point. Uh, 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 that's going to be the key bit. That's going to be the key bit because letting go of your old fears is difficult. An event Absolutely. like this yeah. is, 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 is why I call it a catalyst because it can trigger a change in people's thoughts. They can say, okay, wow, how did this happen? Like, I can't even believe this happened. Why did it happen? That's when you have to jump in and start having that conversation. Um, yeah. And unless you, unless you, unless you do that, it's a, the risk is that this, this conversation we're having, it just stays happening between us. You're absolutely in right. That small segment of the population. Yeah, um, and and I, I think the way you describe it is exactly my life experience. Is that uh, these are thoughts that you you welcome more when people share them with you, and then yeah. they kind and of then, don't they then, don't resonate with uh, with people with, you don't with, interact with. with. More widely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I'm going to. So yeah. building a new Lebanese identity becomes a question of um, um, trying to understand, maybe I guess negate. What the old concept of identity was supposed to mean to people. But let's let's go there. Actually, I'm going to try. I might fail in this. I'm going to try to link that big topic, our identity, with the explosion and the aftermath and what we might see happen. And these are very very big topics, but I, I do think there's some things that line up, and I want to explore this with you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw out a question, and you. I mean, this is completely your own sort of opinion here. Um, do you think sectarianism led to the explosion? Indirectly, yes. Not even very indirectly, but yes. Okay, so so sectarian the the confessional power sharing thing, group, yeah. this Lebanese uh, thing that we live with, contributed to what we saw last yeah. Tuesday. Okay, I'm going to ask them, and then we can kind of we can dance around each question. Yeah, yeah there's a checklist. Uh, do you think? Sectarianism played a larger role than corruption and incompetency in, in the explosion. I think sectarianism feeds, breeds corruption and incompetence. Okay. So, so it's, it's a direct link, direct. yes. Okay. And then maybe a final question and we can go, we can zigzag yeah. across. Uh, do you think security, and I use this word very loosely here, I mean the way security, uh, the way security functions in Lebanon, meaning it could be the army, it could be Hezbollah, it could be anyone with an interest in the port. Do you think they're a byproduct of sectarianism? Or do you, th I mean, in other words, do you think they're, do you think sectarianism plays a larger role than their own sort of role in the port? Is it also a domino effect there? Uh, I think that's a slightly different issue. It's mm. as important, mm. but it probably runs parallel. 
it's enabled by sectarianism. Okay. But it's a very nuanced answer, and what I want to say is that sectarianism post Taif is essentially a political gimmick. But so within that context, yes. yes. But you know, is it sectarianism? No, but you know what I mean. Like the, the, the political interpretation of sectarianism post Taif led to all these things and led to this parallel security problem that we have in Lebanon. Okay. So, my yeah. view is that they're both equally important forces. Right. Yeah. So that's actually a very good way of saying it. So that the political gimmick, which I think I, I agree with I mean, you. That's what it is, right? Th yeah. This interpretation of sectarianism, this making the word uglier than it should be. It should just be a neutral word and we're left to interpret as we see fit. It's become so toxic today in Lebanon oh, to right, even say yeah. that word. So let's say power sharing along confessional lines, the worst, the worst interpretation of that. Yeah. Uh, see, for me... I, and I, I say this as, as knowing that this is an unpopular opinion, at least by conversations I've had. Um, I think it's so entrenched in us and it's so deep and we've been given many opportunities to let go of it. That's the one thing I think. That's the one thing I think Lebanese are by default unable to move on from with the exception of massive explosions like the one we saw. It's, yeah. too, it's too soon to say how this will, this yeah. will uh, tra what this will look like later, but I have a bad feeling that uh, communal power sharing is Lebanon, and there it's like There's a definite. No way around it. I, yeah, and no way around it in terms of in terms of uh, that an explosion of this scale could potentially change the way Lebanon is governed, and that's something that I. I say wishing that it wasn't the case, it's not like something I aspire to, but I sense that it's deeper than all of us appreciate, and it's probably so deep that we don't really think about why it takes so long to implement positive change. I mean, it's, I think it's... Um, well, part, I mean, yeah. so basically the underlying theme is accountability. Okay? Yeah. Everybody that you saw on TV, everybody that was given a mic said, how and why? Mm -hmm. How and why? How and why? Who's? It's not about leaders. It's literally about understanding how this can happen and why it happened. It's accountability. And I think this might jolt people. I mean, you're making me excessively optimistic here. I'm not trying to sound optimistic. I'm, I'm not actually that optimistic. But <laughs> oh, good. At least I'm doing I, something positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I think about like the the, the, the scale of this, the, the, the scale of it, I have a hard time understanding how somebody can can go home at night and just think that you know everything's going to be okay, because something like this just happened. And you know what the good thing is? Again, good thing. Nobody can escape blame. Yes, that's true. Absolutely. This is yeah, the one event right. yes. in the last fifteen years yeah. or thirty years mm -hmm. that nobody can escape the blame for. Okay? I, I, yes, absolutely. And in that sense, in that sense, it's good because. You know, I'm talking to people and be like, hey, Lake Tal Ajaja, look what this guy is saying, I hate him. I'm like, hey, okay, fine. But you can blame him as much as you can blame the guy you love, as much as you, I can blame the guy I love, and you can blame the... They are all to blame. And I'm including Yanni. Yanni, it's a, it's, it's, it's a moment for us because the, the anger is against everybody. And I, think, yeah. and I think that is not something we've typically had. We've always had a, a clear demarcation of allegiances and who we are now, Kaza. And this time you look at it and you're like, in the past 30 years, everybody was at some point in power. And the, the, the thing about this event is that you can't, it's, you cannot say, ah, oh, Raisel Marfa is his fault or the, the, the judiciary, it's their fault. It's literally a combination of things. It's one of those things where you're not going to be able to solve in a court or a quick investigation. We know this. Yes. I mean, you yeah. the law and investigate, but we know this. I, so, I, I, I completely agree with the sentiment. And I think all of the problems that we complain about lined up to contribute to this explosion. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you're right. It's, it's hard to actually Point the finger, which is a good thing, and, and, and which is a good thing. Yeah, because it makes it easier to actually sort of explore all the things that are rotten in the system at once, and and push for serious accountability. But I'm, the reason I'm pushing on this, it's not because I think I think corruption is is a is not a Lebanese problem. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, the the what Lebanon does is really a, a very good job at corruption. <laughs> the corruption that we do is so severe, but that's not a Lebanese trait. Um, and I, I don't think corruption stems out of the old ways we govern Lebanon. 
and that's a that's a, maybe a controversial thing to say, but I think corruption is definitely worse than it was before. That's clear, and corruption has reached levels where people are dying for absolutely no reason. So corruption has sort of fed in to the system and then now is, is associated with the system. But I don't think corruption is born out of uh, sectarianism. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this carefully. It is clear that there was a level of corruption and incompetency that allowed for this kind of stock weapon to, not weapon, uh, explosive material. Explosion. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, to, to, to actually be so close to Beirut without proper monitoring or even sort of awareness. I mean, I think most Beirutis, if we knew that this was a potential threat, they would have been evacuated. So there's, uh, there's, no, there's no justification for that other than there's enough mediocrity, incompetency, and corruption all lining up together in order to just sort of push this years and years and years down and the road. one day it just blows, yeah. Blows up without anyone sort of maybe, I mean, there's whispers now that maybe certain people were trying to say that you need yeah, to get this yeah. out. They were sidelined. So yeah. there, there is that, and that's a very important part of the story. And also, the fact is security in the port is complicated. It's not just the Lebanese state that's sort of managing the port. We have, we have one group that has a very large influence over sensitive sites, airport and port in particular, other sites as well. So, th and I don't think sectarianism is the reason why that group has so much influence in the port either. That's that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So that's I, why that was why I have a nuanced answer for the third. Absolutely. That, that was it because yeah. it's two separate issues, right? In a way, it's as if if you go with theory one, which is it's gross negligence and incompetence and years of okay, so everybody's to blame. We need a new. We need to have a conversation. Yeah. If you go with the theory that it's a small country, you know, not a fly passes without everybody knowing. But yeah. then, sorry, but you know, Amn al Marfa is every security agency in the country has a foot in there. Yeah. Okay. There's a there's the one dominant group that caused the shots. Fine. But you know, you can't tell me I'm the Dawli or I'm the Jaysh because sure. they don't know. It's, of course they know. Yeah. So, so uh, if I went yeah. with that theory, which is a purely uh, 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 a security issue, mm. then we also need to have that conversation. So. However you spin it, you know, and those two items are intertwined. Fine. Maybe sectarianism and maybe the word corruption is the one that's mm, you know, mm. screwing with our minds. Yeah. Because I, I think of it as state capture, really. Sectarianism captured the state by, de by design and by necessity. Mm. So you, you, need to, you need to have access to the state's resources and institutions in order to stay in power as a sectarian leader. Because... That's the pie that everybody dips their fingers in. Yeah. That was the pot that was the compensation for the end of civil war. We all took the state. We said, all right, the state's too weak for, for, for the nation. So let's each take what we need from it and secure our rights, our, our people's rights. Right. right. Yeah. That bred state capture. I think state capture or institutional capture is a better way of describing what we're what we're talking about as corruption because you're right because corruption has corruption, yeah, yeah it yeah, happens yeah. in all countries right. and voila. yeah so let's call it state capture now in parallel because of all these unresolved issues post taif and hezbollah allowing uh, being allowed to retain its weapons for whatever narrative which became less strong after 2000 and blah 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 mm -hmm. we have that security problem as well and if you think about all the incidences since uh, the end of the civil war, it's always been either a security problem indirectly linked to to this non-state actor having, uh, you know, sovereign uh, decision making. That's and, and, and Non-state with sovereign decision making. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. Well, a non-state yeah. state, or uh, or it's been uh, this kind of stuff about uh, forests burning because we don't have helicopters, or or right. floods because we don't have sewers. Okay. Yeah. So now we've got a situation where it's literally both of those things. The, the, Yanni, yeah. how, how, how do you get out of it? If you're the political leadership, how do you get out of this one, right? You can you bit lift us up for mahkamah and for whatever you want for all the other issues, but how do you really get out of this? If you blame security, we're going to have to talk about security. If you blame uh, corruption, neglect, it wasn't me, it was him, we're going to have to talk about that too. Yanni, there's no way out. I, and I, let's go with that, and I share the same sentiment. Do you sense that this conversation, which has been tried in the past and failed, uh, at least in terms of one side of the coin, which is trying to address security concerns, that was eliminated by, by force? That has sort of been shut down over the years rather than explored healthily. Healthily? Is that a word? I think that's a word. 
healthily. We can call it a word, yeah. It's definitely not a word. <laughs> I have no idea, but it sounds okay. It sounds okay, but it's probably not. Has, has been has been explored in, in many in different... In a healthy manner. In a healthy manner. Thank you. You saved me from that. I should always I should always have like a, a standby dictionary just in case. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I'll check afterwards. Side, like... Maybe, yeah. Healthily. Maybe it is a word. Maybe it is healthily. a word. Healthily. We should make it a word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for that, uh, <laughs> healthily uh, exchange. And, but but it was it was so violently shot down, and let's assume that that is just a regional decision beyond Lebanon's control. That means that the force change that one would hope for, at least in terms of accountability and sovereignty, which I think are the two things you're, you're honing in on, one of them is beyond Lebanon's control. The other one, which is just sheer mismanagement and incompetency and, and corruption the way we understand it in, in the Lebanese context, Meaning state capture by by individuals and groups that are that should not be in positions of power. That uh, seems to be possible, and yet here we are at 2020. We've been given many reasons to to to, to remove them, and we've we've held on. And and I'll I'll just maybe um, I'll make it. I'll, I'll try to hone in just on individuals here. Early elections very good chance that the usual suspects will return. Uh, in all likelihood, the president will finish his term. The yeah. Speaker of Parliament will probably yeah, linger on a few more years. Maybe not, maybe not. But it seems like the other side of the coin is just not there either. So then I ask myself what, and the reason I really, I, I your, your tweet uh, two weeks ago resonated with me, is that yes, I short of unable to change in terms of the reforms that people were talking about, the whole entire protest movement, the last 10 months, 11 months, that whole thing, if it's if you can't get political power the the best way possible, which is democracy. Elections, democracy. Yeah, I mean, and, and literally like aspirations from the street, grassroots movement, if that's not within our reach, I just don't see what forced change I don't see room for force change other than the previous examples of force change which have been detrimental. Now that includes that includes how the civil war ended. Yeah. That includes uh, how the Syrian army left and then what, what took its place in the Lebanese context. Uh, that includes also the civil war starting to begin with. I mean, every moment of force change in the country has been one of, one of repercussion. And I, I get like, that's the pattern that I see. I, I would. I, 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 I think I, I know where you're going with what this. I, what I would love to see, in terms of hope, which you said earlier, the uh, the um, silver lining in that sort of uh, economic sense, I would like to see protesters reaching Babda, and I would like to see his people uh, demanding him step down. That to me would be the sign of forced change, meaning this explosion brought everything home. And now we can actually say, you, you, even though you represent us on paper, you don't represent the country. Get, get out. Tell you, okay, I agree with you. But the real, Yanni, to take your point, to the, the one more step mm. is, how, how do I convince the guy who used to vote for this guy to not vote for him in the next election? There are lots of people who are now going to be on the fence Yeah. from yeah. what happened. Yeah. Okay? Lots of people any generation you want who are going who are going to be thinking wait a second who am i going to vote for this i'm sick of this on the fence hey they're still leaning but they can be pulled down on their side mm -hmm. those are the people we need to target that needs to be where that you need to sell a new narrative to that you need to, that's why you know in lebanon we always love to talk about um, the grand bargain the foreign powers that be you know it, it, all the pieces of the puzzle always have to fit in a perfectly you know, aligned manner for things to change yeah. fine that's generally been true um, <laughs> but that's been enabled by a very sleepy voting class a very sleepy very sleepy voters because either we were the post war generation that just wanted to get on with it or we were the the um, uh, uh, what do you call it um, I mean, the people who are very, who became very passive, you know, not very politically engaged and, and yeah. whatever, I yeah. don't vote anymore. Okay? Yeah. Or we were a minority of people pushing and changing and, you know, winning one tiny battle at a time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
the idea is how, 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 how do I convince people who are traditional voters of these big parties to that, you know, that there is another alternative out there. And here's where I lay a big blame on the protest movements because not blame. I mean, it's more like frustration. Yeah. You know, how, how for me the big question is how do you channel that energy into political expression? Yeah, that's exactly my Why point. Yeah, has yeah. It's not happened yet. Why can these differences not be set aside? And like I said, you know, post-Soviet, you had a common enemy that everybody, different people, could unite against. Here we have that common enemy, but it's so much more subtle and so much more nuanced because my enemy was your ally and your ally was my enemy and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, how do we sell the story of, a thir of an alternative way that's based on citizen rights, that's based on individual, that's based on merit, that's based on law, blah, 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 to people who are otherwise reluctant or fearful of change? Um, so this is a long... These guys, yeah. I think it's a long draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. I mean is there is events in a nation's you know when somebody was saying lebanon this is chernobyl moment lebanon's chernobyl moment i was like oh yeah that sounds right i remember reading. i went back and read a bit chernobyl moment refers to a trip the, the catalyst that eventually resulted in the collapse of the soviet union five or six years later and when Gorbachev was reflecting on 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 why on why this would collapse, he recalled the moment where Chernobyl happened and the cover up, and then yeah. the people found yeah. out, and blah blah blah. And over the span of the next few years, that that system no longer became no longer tenable, and it and it dissolved. So right. that's what I'm saying. Our, is that our, if that's our Chernobyl moment, it's not going to be now, and possibly not even in in, in early elections that we'll see the result. But if the spectacular, let's say that, if the failure of the third way groups to gain traction in the 2018 elections is not so bad anymore, if, if you can get five more seats, 10 more seats, if, if there are new alliances that get formed, if, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, will that eventually knock it down? Maybe, because the only other option is what you're saying, which is, and it's still a very, very realistic option, but the, the, you know, the second pillar, which is the violence, which is that these guys go back and resort to what they can do best. Yeah. My only question, and I don't know the answer to this, is that can we have the same sort of civil strife in the presence of a, a single dominant group, which does have the overwhelming force? Because who's going to fight it with any real chances of winning? So, you know, can, like... You know, had, you go, you go. had had they yeah had they been a local actor only I think we would have seen a the worst forms of civil strife return on the streets of Beirut and the simple fact is this is not a local domestic yeah. party with guns this is a regional power funded fund, funded heavily by an external power too so but I guess how important yeah. is their local power base to ensure their viability as a non as a non state externally backed actor my sense and this is born out of speculation. My sense is that the reasons Lebanon has not went back to civil strife, or, or those very te the de delicate moments that we in 2008 and that they did not sort of spill over into civil unrest, I, my sense is that uh, that group um, cannot contain a civil war, and that they would be the first to suffer in that kind of long-term uh, struggle, and they may mm -hmm. actually over time erode and, and change it to something that's less manageable, mm. at least when it comes to Iran's interests. Mm -hmm. So I sense, I sense civil war is the worst case scenario Options for that for group. Them, yeah. yeah. And therefore, that's the one sort of thing that they don't ever allow to actually materialize, at least on their terms. And that's why I think they've been very careful and always having one foot in, one yeah. foot out. At the same time, at the same time, um, I don't think the frustrations on the streets the last 10 months or whatever since October have been uh, pointing in their direction and I think the average protester would rather keep it as sort of that ultimate slogan and that the whole thing has to go I don't think they're they're impacted by that kind of slogan and if they are they retaliate enough to kind of just quell whatever they need to quell and we saw cracks in mm. October, but we did not see sort of... It was almost going to crack, but it did it. Yeah. I mean, we saw patching up very quickly, yeah, very and, quickly. And, and they seem to be coming out clean. And then you have an explosion like this, which, which implicates them by default. They are part of the system. So I think there's two theories here, really, and I, I, I read this somewhere. I don't know what to make of it, but somebody wrote, it's like, okay, so between, you know, the problem of Hezbollah and, 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 the, corrup and the corruption, or the mobsters, he called them, 
um, you know, what do we do first? You know, and and his and his argument was, that, you know, first let's get rid of the mobsters, and then and then we'll deal with the security problem. Um, I don't know if that's the correct way to do it, and maybe what you're saying is that yeah, maybe most people were first and foremost on the streets for. The, 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 the economic the economic dignity yeah and that yeah. was going to be my second point which yeah. is you know we've been talking a lot of politics now and, and stuff like that social stuff but one of the other ways that we can descend into communal violence is because the economy is collapsing and and, 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 and the smaller the pie becomes the more violent the fight over a shrinking share of it becomes. Yes. There's already tons yeah. of anecdotal um, stories uh, and, and evidence of, of lots of groups or parties or sectarian leaders, you know, stockpiling uh, grain and rice and sugar and wheat and flour yeah. and whatnot. Uh, as if when we started understanding that this isn't a serious hyperinflationary famine prone type of crisis, everybody was like, oh my God, I need to, I need to cement my supporter base. And the ultimate logical conclusion to that is that you militize your adherence. Sure, 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 sure. Okay? So yeah. when everything around you collapses, the state collapses, the economy collapses, the currency collapses, I can go to my uh, local leader and he'll give me my, my package of rice and eggs and maybe one day in yeah. return I'll have to fight for him. And this is what happened to Somalia. Somalia remains a country, technically, there's a capital, Mogadishu, that's more or less bankrupt. And provinces that manage to a degree, Puntland could be Kisirwen. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it's kind of a it, it's an ungovernable state, and I think that is a real risk. That is a real risk. Where that is a real risk yeah. because you know I it, remember thinking, yeah. and this was out of naivety, but I remember thinking, oh, you know what, with the crisis so big, um, you know, the political class will realize that the only way to ensure its own survival is to do these reforms, and they'll get sneaky about it, and they'll find a way to hack it. And then I was actually quite surprised that it didn't cross their mind to actually go the easy way and they cemented and hunkered down. Yes. Um, which then leads me to this kind of scary scenario, which is, well, if the logical conclusion is we're all hunkering down and nobody's willing to change, and this kill is incapable of change. They are incapable of change. From mm -hmm. an economics point of view, from a finance point, I can tell you it. Anyway, what is the logical conclusion to that, right? Which is that everybody cements down, gets regional, gets much more tribal, it's much more, um, you know, village to village kind of mentality. Yeah, of I course. secure my people's needs. I have access to the, and, and that's to me the ultimate scary scenario, which is I think worse than a, but you know, civil war in a sense. Sure, and that that is really where you have autonomy born out of frustration and fear, rather than sort of a healthy sort of a exactly. politi political reform and sort of restructuring. But 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 I'm going to say one thing. Lebanon emerged out of a civil war 30 years ago and a very unattractive group of politicians, even the better sort of the more, even the ones with maybe uh, the more well-intentioned would not sort of, it's, in, it's relative, it's put in perspective. But, but let's say there were some people that tried. There were some people that actually tried. Over time, the Syrian army made sure that anyone yeah. really trying would either be thrown out of the country or dead. Or shot. Yeah, that, that, that was the pattern for 15 years. That's a long time. In 2005, it, they, they technically left. Hezbollah took over that, yeah. that rule. And now, in the last 15 years, up until recently, anyone that really tried to change Lebanon for the better. Out of the equation. Gone. Either, either intimidated to shut up, kicked out of the country or dead. And that's why I don't think the port explosion, as, as horrible as that event is, how and, and that everyone is complicit by default, um, I don't think we will be able to take Lebanon to a better place without addressing that one group's priorities, which is keeping a cast of medio mediocre, uh, uh, the worst group of thugs we've experienced in Lebanese politics surviving. And I, I, I don't think that the core of the issue, if it's ignored, let's say we leave it to a sort of later date or later the, stage so, yeah. or regional posturing. I, I get the feeling, and I say this from an, an amateur's, amateur's view, I get the feeling that anything that comes out this time around, if there's going to be some change, will hit the same wall later. Uh, and it may end up being a more well, disfigured. I mean, yeah. Isn't 
isn't there foray and entry into politics the result of of alliances with local parties and if those if if those were to be yani mm, mm. Yeah. if there's enough sentiment that wants a different kind of lebanon okay so then the logic is either you enforce it by by force by the force of arms internally because that's their vision that's how it's going to be right. or or you seek political alliances and you do what they've done in the past you know whatever 10 15 years and then killing off whoever doesn't yeah. but if 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 your argument earlier was uh, you know civil strife actually is not to their advantage is the idea to isolate politically and then find a grand bargain that you know saves us because then we can say look you know the majority of the people don't want them and including including you know their own adherents or is it by default something that is only resolved you know if the bully and the if there's one bully in the playground who's bigger and badder than you you know <laughs> one yeah. way to get him is to just have to team up and take him down i mean that's but but you see the thing is i because i believe in the aspirations on the streets not dismissing them and i actually i i align myself with that kind of aspiration whatever the protesters were chanting for the most part resonates yeah. with me so yeah. that the local but there's that L, there's that yeah and I, i think i i mean i know lebanon is different in certain ways i know the region is different but but it's not like i mean people bosnia had a lot of help dismantling paramilitary groups that would have preferred to have full control over bosnia's security they're gone they're gone people don't think about them anymore they're gone for good the ira is gone The IRA played a yeah, critical role. Ireland's probably the best kind of example. Yeah. They played a critical role in how Northern Ireland sort of functioned. They, they, they're gone. They're gone. And they've, they've matured into something different. Even though maybe some of the aspirations remain on, on, in every post-war environment. But they have to do with the way everybody else does. Yeah. Right. Now, Hezbollah's base, their political uh, inclinations that are local and Lebanese need to be expressed in a local context. That is for sure. And... and um, If anything, it's sort of it would become, I think, probably the most important political party, regardless. But that that's politics, and that's local politics, and that's, and that's healthy. That's healthy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's and healthy. Sinn Fein may be unpopular to certain Northern Ireland citizens, but they have a huge base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's and, fine. But they're they're politics right now. I'm they're, I'm they're all for politics. this. Yeah. I mean, a and, healthy. Yeah. Yeah, and sorry, continue. Uh, I mean, we we did not see that. That's that's my point. I think I've been trying and maybe failing at times to express in different episodes, is that Lebanon did not end the civil war the way it needed to end. It ended with no, one country, sort of making sure that certain players were kept aside and one player remained armed. That's not how you end the civil war. And even now in 2020, we're three decades removed from the civil war. We still have not really gone there. We have not touched that and i think maybe the reasons are are legitimate maybe people are literally afraid of going down that path again that they that they risk their lives by expressing those views openly but at the same time i i just see that as the that's the structural problem that yeah. that plays a role not it's not the reason but plays a role in in the lead up to something like the blasts last week i th- i mean i agree yeah yeah and i i mean I, I think Lebanon cannot do that on its own, just like and other I countries. Think if, if, if we're talking about renegotiating the social contract and coming up with a new pact and 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 a new vision, obviously, yeah, you know that is the one known unknown in the in the equation that that we all need to. You know, yeah, and 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 Northern Ireland had so much help getting there. I was about so, to say. I was yeah. about to say. And we like it's not just the Northern it's Ireland party. We can't just do it internally. I agree. Right. And Bosnia, if anything, was a world was the world's achievement. NATO stepped in. The EU stepped in. Many countries sort of played a role in in keeping Bosnia calm after that war ended. Yeah, but there wasn't. Yeah, there was an agreement to do it. Right. Whereas right. for us, yeah, it's we don't have that equivalent. Tell if if anything cemented the worst uh, gains of the civil war, and kept us paralyzed and that's why ta- when you said taif 2.0 it, 2.0. Kind of, it makes me wonder I, like okay is that just sort of uh, a, a new iranian hegemony idea where iran is sort of the polit- technically the my old- fear is that you know 
there's always, uh, you know, when we think about the 15 garbage crisis and a lot of, there was a lot of hope then, there was a lot of hope in, in 05, there was, a lot of it fizzled out and, and some of the analysis was always like, oh, it was just like a middle class issue or it was, you know, it didn't, it didn't resonate with the big majority of the population. And if this all fails and we end up with a really crappy Taif 2.0, <laughs> Right. Well, I wonder really what it's going to be that sold that, that what, 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 what it's going to be that actually got people to back down and just go back home. Because you yeah. can say that after October, we got the resignation. A lot of people, it sapped their momentum because they said, OK, let's give these guys a chance. And then yeah. COVID happened. Right. Um, and 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 the, to be fair, the political expression of that mom moment never happened. So it was yeah. too diverse and too fragmented. Yeah. If, if that is no longer the case, suppose we have a, a viable alternative locally and suppose there's no COVID anymore, people you know, can, or don't care. Frankly, they just don't care. It's not about COVID not being there, but they don't care. And if this whole thing fails and we have a TAF 2.0 in five years or in three years, what will have, I, I really want to know what would have been the, the what would have convinced people to go back home? Would it have been that because, oh, we're going to have a different electoral law? Would it be because we got, you know, five more guys in parliament that are independent civil society guys? Or or will people really keep pushing for that conversation to happen mm. and for that reckoning to come through because they don't really want to live this way anymore and period. And this event literally brought that point home to them. If, we got, if we're going to push that point to its end, it's either going to be violence or it's going to be, you know, path A where we have macro stabilization and the fund comes in and we can rebuild and we can yeah. deal with it. Yeah. No, no. You're, I you mean, know. that's the, if anything, those are, those are the only two options because there's those no. Those are the only two options. Yeah. The, the, and the, the military is not an option because it, it'll divide. It'll no. crack down the middle. So. And if anything, the middle ground is what we've experienced the last 30 years. So it's there's. It's really it's, at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know. If you reread, uh, since you mentioned the book, I've 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 been rereading uh, the House of Many Mansions. It's 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 scary how pertinent that book still is. Absolutely, and, and, absolutely. And, and sometimes you read it, and you know, I I first read it when I was in you know in you know my late teens, so or early college years. So I was like, you know, it was still a like almost a historical anomaly to me. Yeah. And then you reread it now, and you're like, man, it's so it's still so relevant and and even so some of the analysis is outdated but it's still in large part holds true so it's you know when it's, they it's say not, when there's a problem 50% yeah. of the problem is knowing that there is a problem <laughs> yeah, and the right. remaining we know we know <laughs> we've known for 100 years what's interesting about that book is that it ends prior to Lebanon so it, it ends before the birth of greater Lebanon exactly and yet it's not a historic book. It's not looking no. back. It's actually still there. It's modern, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, and that and that that's a story born out of Lebanon's attempt, Lebanese attempt, communal attempt at sharing something together before the French mandate. So I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that is part of us. And going back to the beginning of the conversation, I, I would like for us to emerge from that. I don't think it fits. I don't think it suits the 21st century. I think Lebanon can do better. I think we can do many things that Taif told us to do. We can do a Senate. We can we can incorporate the communal divisions in a in a very very in a blessed way where we celebrate our differences and they're yeah, they're enshrined. Which are, which, yeah. It'd be very but, boring. It would be very boring if we were all the same. I think. Yeah, and I yeah, think that I is. Totally agree. Yeah, that's Lebanon's charm. I think is that many different types of Lebanese live side by side. So there's a way to celebrate that. But you know what? Thirty years ago, the idea of the Senate was floated, and here we are. You know. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I mean, so you think it's ingrained and it's more. I think the 1989 should have been the end of the civil war, and then two years later, we should have had a Senate. And we should have the, had a Truth and Reconciliation Committee right. or something. And, too. and you know what? All the legitimacy for Hezbollah staying armed during the Israeli years in the south in 2000, Sheba should not have been the lifeline for politics weapons oh. and Hezbollah mixed together, that made no sense. 2000 Hezbollah should have been, should, they should have disarmed. These are the moments I think that, uh, and, and 2005, after Hadidi's assassination, whatever your thoughts are about his politics prior to that, but after that assassination. That's a pivotal moment, yeah, I agree. Lebanon's sovereignty should have returned fully, meaning, meaning that 
all all areas of security are now under the state's domain. It's not one group's concern. It's yeah, yeah, everyone's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that yeah. that didn't happen. So, I guess for me, it's wanting to end the civil war, and by default, you need to disarm every single non-state actor. That's a precondition. Doesn't matter what sect or what belief system. Doesn't matter. Any group with weapons should cease to exist. And you can't build the state otherwise. Yeah, and sovereignty is by my and my understanding of it is a precondition for accountability. You need to hold something to account. It would be great if you could actually just demand the president, prime minister, and speaker to resign over this incident, and that anyone that was damaged would get would get taken care of, and the state would be held to account. We don't have that. We don't have that. So I think that. Something as a precondition should have happened already, and it didn't happen. And I think that's yeah. what I would like to see eventually take hold, even if it's at the expense of a huge, tremendous travesty. Uh, that, that, that to me is the beginning of ending the civil war. Short of that, it just seems like it's Lebanon it's as usual. In a wheel, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then it's sort of that I we think, have. I we, think a we, lot we, of, yeah. I think a lot of the undertones of what's happening now. I think recognizes your point and, mm. and, and, you know, there is no escape. You cannot build a state when yeah. there is a non-state actor that has a different idea of sovereignty. It's just not possible. Right. Um, and they're now protecting the regime from crashing as well. Yeah, so because it's, they yeah. benefit from yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. vested, obviously, like it's, yeah. it's, it's a perfect system for them. Exactly. Uh, yeah. For, I thought about FARC in Colombia the other day, and yes. I read up about you know how did that happen? Because FARC back in the day was immensely strong, uh, sovereign, sovereign level strong. Like mm-hmm. they, 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 they got, they had, they had access to the judiciary and to the army and things like that. Yeah. Um, and how did it, how did that turn? And it and it turned over many many years. And it it was a military conflict actually. The disarmament yeah. of FARC was a military operation first and foremost. Um, but it all but they also sapped a lot of the popular support that existed for FARC because FARC had this network and was taking care of a lot of people and so on. Um, so I think it's it's the conversation has to happen internally because it needs to be homegrown and. In parallel, there needs to be a hands-off kind of approach externally, which I don't know if we're savvy enough to pull off. I have no idea. And I, I hope, all I hope for, because this is, I mean, this conversation is largely born out of immense pain on the streets yeah. of Beirut, throughout the country, and also the explosions. I hope, I hope that Lebanon can at least wobble and not fall completely, where that the citizens who are still there living their lives, do not have to worry about dying because of mismanagement, corruption, and insecurity in the city's port. I mean, And I, hopefully this, they'll yeah. realize that all these years that they suffered were, were for nothing. Yeah. And maybe that'll yeah. and, just jolt them. Right. And I'd like symbolic gestures to turn into sustainable, permanent change, yeah. no matter how long it takes. Nafiz, you're very generous with oh, your time. La, 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 la. You've given me a lot of your time. Um, I'm going to say thank you for that, number one. Number two, thank you for dressing up like me for the occasion. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, always yeah. looks good when someone Did looks like me. <laughs> I'll take it. Hair's a uh, little different, but other yeah, than yeah, that, yeah. We're, we're both in our suit and tie. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll also say, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll share something, uh, make it part of the episode, that I, <laughs> don't, don't tweet and shower at the same time. They say that the phone is... Uh, uh, water resistant or whatever so i decided i'm going to catch up with the news and i slipped as a result so don't don't end up oh, like that's, me that's how it happened <laughs> okay, don't fine. don't don't go on twitter while you're uh while twitter you're supposed so to be obsessive. i'll try yeah. to keep it out of the shower <laughs> shampoo and twitter don't work together it's <laughs> good advice man. multitasking advice. is not uh yeah not my thing <laughs> it's not my forte either so it's good <laughs> Nafis, Excellent. thank you so much for your time it's very very good to be on the show we'll uh, talk soon i hope Thanks for listening, and a friendly reminder to help support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box below. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.